Well, if you've got your Bibles, we wanted to share, uh, we've been in a series called Kingdom Journey, uh, and today we're going to continue on that. We've been sharing really about Paul's second missionary journey, and uh, really he's just been encouraging churches. He's been sending letters uh, to church, churches he's planted along the way, and so if you've been with us through this whole series, it started out with um, Paul had planted churches in the first his first journey, uh, and Barnabas and John Mark went in one direction and ministered to those churches, and uh, Paul and Silas went another direction, and uh, he went through all of these different cities, and that's what we're going to talk about today, is one of the cities he landed in called Ephesus, and we'll, that's where you get your book of Ephesians, so if you've got your Bible, you can open to Ephesians chapters 1 through 3, uh, that's where we'll be today, um, but I'll show you a map real quick. If you're new with us, I'll catch you up. And so uh, here's Paul's second missionary journey, over 2,000 miles uh, by foot or animal, no cars or planes. So it was a long journey, but you, you know he went through a lot of different cities that you may be familiar with. But he started in Jerusalem, then he did a circle all the way back to Jerusalem. And so uh, a few weeks ago, we uh, talked about a couple different cities. He was in Galatia, where you get your book of Galatians. Then he went to a seaport town called Trios and sailed across to Philippi, which is where you get your book of Philippians. <laughs> Uh, then he went down to, uh, he was asked to leave Philippi, and last week we shared about uh, Thessalonica, the city he went to, where you get your book of the First and Second Thessalonians. And then he traveled down to uh, a couple other places, Berea and uh, Corinth. Now, when he's going to those cities, he's actually being chased and trying to be trapped and, and, uh, and martyred. Uh, so he's running town to town, but he doesn't stop preaching the gospel. It's amazing how he stays focused. And then he sees, uh, goes across the sea over to Ephesus is where you get your book of Ephesians. So yes, there's a book of Corinthians. I'm not skipping it on purpose, but I'm going to Ephesus, and then we'll, we'll close with the book of Corinthians uh, in this series. And then he travels back to Jerusalem uh, where he ends the second missionary journey. So today, I want to talk about uh, Ephesians, and I want to talk about our position in Christ. And so we're going to talk about two things uh, in Ephesians. First of all, our position today, and then in July, uh, we're going to close uh, the Ephesians, and we'll look at uh, really our responsibility as believers, and we'll talk about that in July. But next week, we've got a very special service. It's at our Deacon Sunday. We're going to introduce to you some new deacons that will be joining our team, our leadership team here at Rep Westridge. And so we'll talk about the importance of deacons and leadership in the church uh, in our message next week, but you'll get to meet some great people, men and women that serve, uh, that have uh, stepped on in leadership here, and so you'll get to see them. So make sure you're here next week uh, as well. There's probably some uh, deacons, uh, deaconesses or deacons sitting here in the room that possibly could be with us down the road, but we want you to uh, meet those that are serving in different areas next week, and so you'll be here uh, for next week to hear about that, and then we'll continue on in our kingdom journey uh, in July and pick up in Ephesians and close that out. Um, so Today, I want to talk about our position in Christ. So it's Father's Day. A lot of guys are probably going to be cooking on the grill, right? Cooking on the grill, making some barbecue, doing some fun things. And so, or you're cooking, uh, you like to cook some meat. And so today, there's a lot of meat in the message today. So you're going to really be able to, like, if you like a good barbecue, you know, when, when dad makes a good barbecue, you just keep picking at it. It's just something you keep eating through the day. And so this would be one of those messages. There's just, uh, it's very simple in, the, in, in one way and very complex in another. But there's a lot of meat here for you to chew on uh, for, for our dads today uh, and a lot for you to take away. So today, I want to talk about first the key to our position in Christ. And so you're going to see in Ephesians, uh, the, this term is mentioned eight times in the first three chapters, his glory. The focus is on Christ. So the key uh, to our, our position in Christ is always Jesus. It's not our works. And Paul makes it abundantly clear. In fact, he says it many different ways all through Ephesians uh, that it's because of Jesus that we're saved. It's because of Jesus that we have uh, our our position, our understanding. And so Paul begins to describe this to the church of Ephesians. Now there's a lot of uh, false doctrine being weaved through the church. This is the church early on. And even today in our churches today, uh, there's a lot of things that makes, uh, you know, your relationship with Christ about you, about what you do, about your works, or about gaining favor in Christ, or it makes it about you. But Paul makes it abundantly clear. Now you, we have a place to play, but without Jesus, there's no position for us. There's no salvation for us. There's no uh, forgiveness for us. We need Christ. We need a Savior. And so Paul makes that clear, and he talks about uh, this, the key to our position. So in uh, Ephesians chapter 1, let's start there. Uh, he gives us in uh, verses 3 through 6, uh, he begins to talk about uh, how he chooses us. Again, maybe you're here today and you're new to the Bible or you're new to church. A lot of times we think that we chose Jesus. Uh, but you see all through the scriptures, no, God chose you. God made you and he chose you and he's known you before this time even started when you were born. And so he says this in verse three, he says, blessed be God and Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing, 
blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Just as he chose us in him before the foundations of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons of Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to be praised to be to the glory of his grace, by which he made us and accepted us in the beloved. Now, uh, Paul says, look, I want you to be very clear about a few things. That before this place was even made, before earth and the foundations of the earth were laid, he chose you. He knew you. I mean, kids, imagine that. That you, we all came to this earth at some time, but imagine God has known you from when he made the earth. I mean, you're probably learning all these things in school about creation. Well, before anything happened, he knew your name. He knew my name. For many of us, myself included, uh, we walk through a season of our lives maybe thinking God doesn't know us or he doesn't love us. Maybe you, maybe you have the thought of maybe he's not happy with you. But really what we see and what Paul's telling the Ephesians and he's telling you today is, no, no, God chose you. He desires that you know him. He desires that you will know his will. And we're gonna see that. But he chose you and he makes it really clear it's because of Jesus, all of us exist. It's because of Jesus, we're even here but he knows you. It talks about this, uh, this word called predestination, and I'll just encourage you, it's much higher than we can understand. I've gotten a little mess. Predestination basically means that God knew all things before they even happened. Well, I believe that to be true. We can't get in the game of us understanding that aspect of God. He's God. His ways are higher than ours. His thoughts are higher than ours. And so, yes, God did know you before you were born. There's, God knows all things. He's, he's, he's so much more higher in our thinking and understanding. But when we try to put ourselves in that space, we get a little confused and get a little lost sometimes. In fact, there's a, there's a whole uh, teaching in the church world today that we don't need to lead people to Christ because God's already selected them. But that goes against so many scriptures where Jesus' ultimate commandment before he went to heaven is says, go and make disciples. Now, the fact of what, uh, the matter that God knows doesn't negate us from doing our, because we don't know. We don't know. But here's what we do know. And here's what I believe about the Lord is he chose, he made everybody. And we all have the same opportunity to choose God. We all have the same opportunity. Jesus made it equal for everybody. Jesus went to the cross for everybody. He died for everybody. And Christ is for all. But he doesn't force you. He doesn't make you. And you're not just some number. He knows you. So our position in Christ is first, he chose you. Second, in Christ, there's a lot of things that when you follow Christ, that you get, you get to receive, not because of you, but because of him. Here's what it says in verse seven. It says, in him we have redemption through his blood, forgiveness of sins, and according to the riches of his grace, which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will. Listen to this. You can know his will. You can know the mystery, the, the gander. He, he's chose you, and he's given you this understanding that and. Uh, The fullness of times, he might gather together one and all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth. And here's the caveat, in him. And you're gonna see this over and over in Ephesians, in him, in him, in him. It's not about us when it comes to these things. We do have a part to play. And that's what you're gonna see in chapters four through six. But without Jesus, we have nothing. Without Jesus, we don't have forgiveness. Without Jesus, we don't have salvation. Without Jesus, we don't have the earth. Without Jesus, we don't have the things that we see and understand, the air that we breathe, the people that we see. We have nothing without Christ. But what an amazing God that he did. Before anything was made, he chose you. And secondly, he's made a way for all of us. Redemption's a big word. We don't use it very often. Whether you're a child or adult, you don't use redemption, but it's like redeeming a coupon. We've done that before, or not even in our day. We don't redeem many coupons. There's not much coupon cutting anymore, right? You use promo codes, right? You use your phone. You scan the, you scan the barcode. 
And when you scan that barcode for that coupon for that item, you get a discount, right? You get, uh, you get some benefit by using that promo code. Well, that's what redemption is. Jesus, you have a tremendous benefit when you are saved by Christ. He's redeemed all of your sins. He's taken it back. You have the benefit of transferring your mistakes and receiving his righteousness. It says he forgives your sins. He makes things right for you. And now you have the ability to know his will. Now, the great thing about Ephesians, I don't know if you know this or not, Paul on his journey is going through these towns and people are coming to Christ or they're following Jesus. He's planting churches. But when he's writing Ephesians, he's writing from prison. From prison. He wrote Philippians and Ephesians in a Romans jail. And then he found a way. I don't know how he did it. I don't know how it works in jail in his days, but he found a way to get these letters to the church. And notice when Paul's writing, and I don't know about you, but you know, I've had my insecurities, I've had my doubts and, and things, but you don't see in Paul's writing saying, well, I, you know, because in prison, right, you, you, you lose freedom. You lose the ability to, like, Paul can't just go out and do what he wants. He's, he's literally in a, in a cell, sometimes uh, even shackled, where he can't leave. He's, he's tied to a wall, but he finds a way to get this letter to the Ephesians. And he's not saying, well, I hope this to be true. He's very confident in who he is. He's very confident in these facts that in Christ, there's some benefits. And those benefits transcend where you're at today. It goes above, maybe you're in prison. Maybe you're having a hard time. Maybe there's some difficulty in your life. Maybe you're struggling in school. There's something that Jesus has done in you that regardless of where you're at in life, these facts don't change. He saved you, he's redeemed you, and he's, you can know the will of God, the mysterious understanding of what God has for you. You can know it. So Paul goes on to write and says, there's some guarantees or there's a guarantor Do you know what a guarantor is? Usually in our world, when you go buy something and you can't afford it or or there's a high risk for you, they want somebody that's a lot more secure. And so like if you're going to buy a house and you don't have all the funds and and your monies aren't uh, totally in line, they're gonna say, I want you to have a guarantor, which is I need someone that's more financially stable than you are, that if you'd stop making the payments, they're gonna step in and start making the payments. That's what a guarantor is in in our world. Look at this in verse 11. It says, in him, we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, that we have first trusted in Christ, should be able to praise of his glory. In him, you've, you've trusted after you've heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and, and you, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Verse 14 says, who is the guarantee? He's your guarantor. The Holy Spirit is the one that seals you. Who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchase of the possession or until you get to go to heaven and stand before God and he says, you know, when we all stand before Jesus, he's not gonna look at you and go, I'm not sure if you're saved. He's not gonna look at you and go, you got your coupon? You know how he's going to know? The Holy Spirit's in you. He's the guarantor. He's the one that says, yep, he's mine. She's mine. That little one's mine. There's not going to be any negotiating. There's not going to be any fooling God and getting into heaven. No, the seal of the Holy Spirit will be on every believer, and God will know. The key to every one of these positions is Christ, is being in Christ. It's not what you do. It's not the good things you do. It's not earning Christ's favor. It's realizing that you have a God that's so good to you. It's realizing that you have a Christ that knows you, 
knows you, knows your name, knows who you are, knows what you're dealing with, knows what your struggles are, knows about your friends and your family situation, knows all of these things. And he chose you. He chose you. Whether you realize it or not, he chose you to know him, to understand him. And when you come to that place, as Paul said, to believe in the gospel of salvation, when you come to that place to receive what Jesus has done for you, there's a rich inheritance from God to you. Now, that's not why you serve Jesus. That's not why you come to Jesus. It's just the reality of now who you are. Your position in Christ is you're now part of my family. And with that comes the benefits of being a Christ follower and the responsibility of following. It's not just a simple, yeah, I believe in Jesus. No, you follow Jesus at all costs, in all ways, because he paid a heavy price for you. We're indebted to him. So that's our position. Remember, the key is what? It's Christ. Yes, you are a person. Yes, you make choices. Yes, you chose to believe. But from the beginning of time, God made that opportunity for you. He's the one that set it in motion. He's the one that set it in place. Hold on to these keys. They're given to you from him. But again, the theme of Ephesians 8 eight times is given to you for him, for his glory. Your life, my life, all of our lives as Christ followers is, is for his glory. It's to point to him. Second, he says the power given to the church is through Christ. Now, do you realize, and I don't know, uh, I did this in second service and or first service, and I, I was telling them, I don't know what your thoughts are about the church. Like if we pulled everybody in here and we pulled the world and we pulled a whole bunch of people and we, we would get a very diverse idea of, of the church, wouldn't we? But the reality is, is it doesn't matter what the enemy says about the church. It doesn't matter what Satan says about the church. And it doesn't matter what all of the, now I'm not saying, uh, here's what I, I'm not saying is, look, people, the church is people. And those people can sometimes make mistakes but that doesn't mitigate the church of not being powerful. It is only through the church that Jesus Christ, and I hope you see this today as we walk out here, it's only through the church that Jesus is gonna display his power. He's not gonna display his power through political agendas. He's not gonna display his power through your education, through your job, through your position, through your financial status. He's not gonna display his power. Now he can use all of those things for his glory, but he speaks through the church. It's through the church that he's going to display who he is, his miracles, his signs, his wonders, faith. It's through the church. You won't find it in other religions. You won't find it in anything else except for in Christ. You're going to find it in Jesus. And he says this in Ephesians chapter 1. And I'm going to read uh, verses 18 through 23, but I may pause for a couple of things because I think it's really important. But he says, uh, this is Paul praying for the Ephesians and praying for you. And here's what he says in verse 18. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what, the, what is the hope of his calling, which are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe? Let me stop there for a second. Paul says it's so important that you know the calling God has on you. It's not like Jesus is holding a carrot out in front of you and saying, here's what I have for you, but you can't have it. No, Jesus chose you. He died for you. And when you receive the wonderful gospel that he gave you, a change happens. You're a, you're a new creation. The Bible says you're new. And not only are you new, but now you can know the will that God has for you and for me. You know, the, the biggest counterfeit or lie that the enemy has, has spoken to believers is that you can't hear from God. If he can disarm you as a Christian of receiving salvation and being and having this idea that you can't hear from God and you can't know his will because you're not holy enough, if he can do that, he can dis disarm you as a believer. 
The very power that Jesus died to use through the church has now been disarmed because you believe the lie. But, the, but Paul is saying, no, the very thing you need to know is he chose you and you can know the will that God has for you. You can know it. And watch what he says. Now, watch how this all comes together. You can know the, the calling that he has for you. And with that calling comes an inheritance, comes great richness through Christ in Christ for the saints and for those who believe, a greatness of his power according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him on the right hand of heavenly paces far above principality, power, might, dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one that which is to come. Jesus didn't just say that you could just, you know your calling, but it's the very calling an understanding of what Jesus has done in you, that he's going to give you power. He's going to give you this amazing confidence and, and affirmation of who you are in Christ. And it's, listen, we had no part of that. It's simply Jesus saying, this is the kingdom of God, and this is where I choose to display my goodness and my power. It's through the church. It's through my saints. It's through those who believe. Notice there's no caveats. There's no exceptions. There's no asterisk on the coupon. It's only through believers. That's the church. I don't know what you believe about the church, but you need to eradicate it. This is what Jesus says the church is. The very power, mighty power of God that rose him from the from the grave that's above all power, all principalities. You know, we hear a lot. In fact, I was, I was watching a thing this week on, uh, I think it was on YouTube or, or something like that, but it, there was just a, a debate between um, a Christian and, and uh, uh, he called himself an atheic, atheist agnostic, which are just terms that basically mean you don't believe God, but you think there could be a God. Well, you're either one or the other. <laughs> but basically the discussion was, is he's trying to trap this Christian, just saying, look, you, you can't know God. You can't know God. And he basically got to a point to say, look, this book is irrelevant. It's old. And it is old. I guess in old in comparison to how long the earth's been in existence, but the reality is Jesus is eternal, so it's not very old compared to eternity. But Jesus is above all powers, all principalities, all generations. So the minute we sit here and say, well, this book is irrelevant, let me just put it in perspective. Actually, we're the ones that are going away. He continues on. So now who's the irrelevant one? Me. Me. I understand that we live in a culture and we live in a world, but God has lived in every culture and every world and every generation. So if anybody has understanding above mine, it's going to be the guy that's been there all the way through. But we have the audacity, and they, this, this man had the audacity to say, this God that you worship is irrelevant, but here's God saying, and here's Paul saying, look, I'm above all powers and principalities, regardless of what people say. I'm above it. I'm above it. And the very power that has been that is in Christ will be given to the church. This same power rose Christ from the day grave. This same power raised him to the seat of the Father. This same power. This is the church. I hope you're okay with this. He goes on to say, let me read the final sentence. It's, it's amazing. So all these, all, and uh, let me just start over where it says, he's, he's over all principality, all power, all dominion, every name that is named, not only in this age, but the one is to come. Watch this. And he, Jesus, put all things under his feet. The Father put all things under Jesus' feet and gave him, Jesus, to be the head over all things. And he gave all authority to who? To the church. It's only through his saints. It's only through his followers. That's where Christ is going to reign. That's where his power is going to come. Now watch the church, which is his body. I'm the head of this church. I'm leading this church, but I'm not the head of the church. Jesus is the head of the church. We're the body. He's the head. We're the body. And it goes on to say the fullness of Christ 
who fills all in all. Is that how you view yourself? Speaking about position of Christ, you are the church, you're Christ's body, and the very authority that's in Christ that puts all things under his feet, he distributes to the church. And the way people are gonna know who Christ is is through the church. The very power of the church is gonna know all in all. They're gonna see Christ through you. And Paul begins to describe this as that you've got to understand as a saint of God, as a, as a child, as a mom or as a dad or as a boy or a girl, you've got to understand that God, when you follow Jesus, there's so much power that God's going to do in and through you because he's the one that you worship and he's going to use you in your schools, in your homes. He's going to use you. He chooses to use you. He only chooses the church. So whatever your, whatever your belief is about the church, whatever you came walking in here with about it, you need to know this is the church that Jesus described. This is what he's talking about. This is where he speaks. This is where heaven comes to earth. It's only through the church. Nothing else. No soothsayers, no fortune tellers, no YouTubers. It's only through those who follow Christ. That is how he's gonna speak That is how he's going to reveal himself. And then Paul describes these mysteries. I love this part of Ephesians. He says, oh, there's some mysteries that from the beginning of time people wanted to know, but God is speaking them, and I want to share them with you. Do you want to hear what those are? These wonderful mysteries. Paul says, first, you were dead. We were dead in our sins, and Christ made us alive. That's the first mystery, and I think we've heard this in the church a lot, but in verse four of, of chapter uh, verse four of chapter two, it says, "But God, who's rich in mercy, because of his great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our sin, or our trespasses, it's the same word, made us alive together with Christ." Now watch Paul clarify, "By grace you've been saved." and raised up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ. That in the ages to come, he may show exceeding riches in his grace and his kindness towards us in Christ. For by grace, you've been saved through faith, not of yourselves. This teaching is not new, church. For hundreds and thousands of years, people try to make it about themselves. That's because the very one who was thrown out of heaven named Satan made it about himself. And since then, that's how he's ruled on this earth is he's tried to make it about us because he's making it about him. But Paul clarifies and says, no, no, it's not by yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works. It's not by what you do. It's not by what you earn. It's not by what you give, lest anyone should boast. You know you'd do it. If it was about what you did, you'd make it about you and you say, yeah, I did that. No, Jesus did it. No, 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 no. That was me. Pride's an ugly beast. And Paul makes it clear. You're not saved by you. You're saved because of Jesus. For we are his workmanship. Now watch this, verse 10. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. You see, many get confused of saying we earn God's favor by doing good works, but Paul says, no, no, no. You're saved by Christ. You're saved by grace and faith in Christ, and because of that, you'll do good works because now you know the one who's good. You know, the other facet of many people that get distracted is like, all people are good. They can't be. I think in our hearts, we want to be good, but define what good is. And this is, the, this is the challenge for many of us. We can't define what good is because your view of good and this person's view of good and my person's view of good, they may be way out there. This one may say, oh, it's okay to lie and cheat. Well, he says that's good. Is it okay? You have to have a measure. And the measure of good is Jesus. The measure of good is perfection. The measure of good is the one that's never sinned before. And we need that measure. That's the one who saved us. That's the one that's good. And now when you've received salvation from Christ, not by what you've done, not by your works, but by grace through faith, you've received salvation. Now you do good because you know the good one. And now that you know Christ, he has, from the beginning of time, he's destined that you do these good things. 
He sets you up on a track to succeed, not to fail, to, su- to succeed, to do good works. Paul says that's the first mystery. Second, the second mystery is Christ gives you access to the Father. Christ gives you access to the Father. In Ephesians 2, verse 17 and 18, it says, And he came, Jesus came, and preached peace to you, both you who were afar off and those of you that were close. That kind of covers everybody. You're either far off or you're near. But he came and preached to everybody. Verse 18 says, For through him, through Jesus, we both have access by one spirit to the Father. Here's the Trinity in one verse. Because of Jesus and through the Holy Spirit sent by the Father, you now have access to the Father. But it's only because of Christ. It's only because of Christ. But what a, what a beautiful mystery that is. Paul is saying, look, you now have access to God. You have access to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit because of Christ. Because of what he's done, the Father sent the Spirit to you. The Spirit's now living inside of you. Jesus is interceding for you, and you have access to the Father as well because of Christ. The third mystery, which is mind-boggling, I hope this one, uh, I was talking to somebody out in the lobby, he goes, I never realized this, but it's Christ's plan through the church. You know, we like Hollywood movies. How many like movies? You like movies? Good movies? There's a lot of movies out there about spiritual things, spirits. And unfortunately, we've, we've lost our understanding and purpose in these areas. But look, Paul says, I want to explain something to you that, uh, that the Lord showed me. I, I want to show you in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 9 and 11. Look at, what Christ, or look at what Paul says about... Now, this is through the church. This is through believers. He says in verse 9, it says, I was chosen to explain to everyone this mysterious plan that God, the creator of all things, had kept secret from the beginning. God's purpose and all this was to use the church, again, he's talking about you, the church, believers, to display his wisdom and a rich variety to all the unseen rulers and authorities in heavenly places. This was his eternal plan, which he carried out through Christ Jesus, our Lord. You know, a lot of times we give the enemy too much credit. A lot of times we, we think about things in the wrong way. But I want you to think about this. Paul's writing this from prison. It looks like he's lost. He's preaching the gospel. He's, he's arrested and thrown into prison for preaching the gospel. It looks like the enemy's won this one. But this is what I love about Paul. That's what I love about this book. Remember, he's writing this from prison. He's saying, hey, guys, look, it doesn't matter what your circumstance is. I'm in prison, and my position hasn't changed. I'm in prison, and it doesn't matter what the enemy says. I hope you know this, that Satan and the angels, those that fell from heaven, they were once standing before Christ. They were once able to see his glory, but they chose to worship themselves and got thrown out of heaven. They once got to see the wonders of God. They once got to see all of those things, and they chose to choose pride. They chose to worship themselves and Satan himself. And now they've been separated from God. Just like when you sinned, you're separated from God. But God, by his grace, has given you the wonderful opportunity to choose salvation through Christ. The angels don't have that opportunity. So what a crazy plan is this? (laughs) Paul says, what a wonderful mystery is this. He's hidden this from the beginning of time until the church came. And now this is one of the purposes of the church, to stare Satan in the face, especially when you're in moments of prison, when you're struggling and you don't understand. What a crazy way to think, to say that Christ has not only saved you, but one of your plans as a church is to to look at Satan and all the demons and say, I want to teach you something about the one that I worship. How many times do we let him 
lie and deceive and, and, and accuse us. Instead, we, can, we have the very power as a church to say, one of my plans, one of the purposes God's given to me as a saint of God is to teach you a few things. Because you obviously checked out and you really don't know him. You chose yourself. So let me tell you who God is. Let me tell you who the one that I worship is. Let me tell you about Christ, the one that you, the one that threw you out of heaven. Let me show you a few things. You know, next time that you're in prison, next time you're going through something that's difficult or hard, I told you this is simple to understand, but it's very complex because now the situation doesn't matter, does it? Think about it. The situation doesn't matter because you could be in the situation. Your position in Christ doesn't change. Your salvation doesn't change. Your redemption doesn't change. None of that changes. You're still in Christ regardless of where, what the enemy's throwing at you. But now when the enemy's throwing something at you, now you can say, hey, my plan is to tell you about this wonderful God that I worship. It's to teach you a few things, devil, and you need to know. The very power of God is in you as the church through Christ through Christ please don't take it out of order the order is important it's in Christ but it's only through the church look Jesus should be able to put the church in any situation and they have all power they have all authority you have the key Christ you have the Holy Spirit in you you have everything you need to succeed so I can put you in any situation, in any location, in any school, with any friend. I can put you in any place. And when you know who you are in Christ, you're gonna win. When you understand the power that God's put in you, you're gonna do well. You're gonna, you're gonna show not only those people that you're serving around you, but even the demons shudder at the name of Christ. And Paul says, you can teach him a few things about the one that you worship. Finally, come boldly to Christ. Paul says this in Ephesians 3, in him we have boldness and, accident, and access with confidence through faith in him. It's not about arrogance. This is about confidence and faith in the one that you worship. You can come boldly at any time to the presence of God. Yes, on Sunday. Yes, on Monday. Yes, on Tuesday. At any time you can come. Therefore, I ask you, don't lose heart. If, you, if you're losing heart today, put yourself back in the position to say, what did Jesus do for me? What are the keys? What has God done in me? I'm a saint of God. I'm a child of God. I've been adopted by Christ. I'm, I'm before this world was even known, before I walked in this situation, God knew me and chose me. It really is phenomenal how much intention Jesus has put into you. How much investment he's put into you. How much authority and power he's put into you. Before the foundations of the world, you and you. Don't let the enemy lie to you and accuse you. Don't doubt yourself. Look to Christ, look to him. Keep abounding, keep growing in Christ. This is the theme. It's for his glory. Our lives, think about it, our lives. Everything you do is for his glory. Everything you achieve and work for, every, every you know, we're dads, we're fathers. Every one of our kids is for his glory. It's for him. It puts a new perspective on things. Learning these mysteries that you're in this season, you're in this situation for a reason, and God's gonna use you. Stand to your feet, I just wanna speak a word of encouragement. If you've been around church, I've only known two churches in my life, this one and one in Texas, and then we came back. So good here, we had to come back. God's doing a lot in this church. But Paul's the best at benedictions, right? It's, it's how he ends letters, it's how he ends services. And I just wanted to speak this over you and then I'll dismiss and you guys can all gather and huddle and have some fellowship and eat some ice cream. 
Here's what he says in Ephesians 3. Just close your eyes. Just listen. It's not going to be on the screen. Just listen. Imagine a guy from prison writing and sending this to you. This is what he says in verse 17. That Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. That you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width, the length, the depth, and the height to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to Jesus, to him be the glory in the church, by Christ Jesus, to all the generations, forever and ever. Amen. Lord, we thank you. Lord, if there's anybody in this room or online that hasn't given their life to you, or they feel like you don't know them, I pray today that they see that you chose them. We didn't choose you, you chose them. Today's the day of their salvation. They don't have to wait till they get it right. They don't have to wait till they can do more good works. Today, they can receive this wonderful gift of salvation that before the world was even created, you made this moment, you made this amazing salvation for us. And so Jesus, we choose you. For those of us that have received that salvation, God, we, we receive what you're saying to us today. In fact, Lord, I, whether today's the first time you give your life or you've been following Jesus for 20 years, Paul says the same truth will be true in both cases. It's for his glory. It's for his kingdom. And Lord, we just thank you that you have put us on this kingdom journey and it's bigger than we think. It's more powerful than we think. It's the only thing that will live on forever, serving you and honoring you and worshiping you. That's the only thing that goes on. And so God, we choose to worship you today. We choose to walk out of this church, this building as, as the, the bodies gathered together. And we choose to say, God, I'm, there's something this week you have for me. Give me your will, give me your understanding, give me your knowledge. And God, invest your power inside of me so that I can point people to Christ in all ways, in all situations. In Jesus' name we pray, everyone said.